Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, weekday warriors and weekend funsters. Strap yourself in and get ready for another tech talking sesh with our favourite tutor of the future, Mr. Matthew Dickerson. How are you, Matt, and what's been on your mind this week? Well, James, it's getting to that time of year where Christmas is coming, Santa's coming, of course. Oh, don't we all know it? We do know it, and things are starting to be seen in shops where we've got all these lovely decorations. So people have started saying to me, what am I going to buy my husband, wife, Mm. daughter, son, grandchild, whatever, for Christmas? He's a real tech nerd. What can you advise? So I've started to think about a few other things that might be there, and I've looked back through some of the episodes we've done throughout the year, and we've often come up with some little gadgets that are available or little gimmicky things that are Mm -hmm. technology-based, but I thought as a bit of a treat for our listeners, we might do a dedicated episode that's presents for the tech nerd in your life. Oh, this is going to get me out of trouble. (laughs) This is great. Yes, I'm looking forward to this. Or into trouble, because I know you've bought most of the things we've (laughs) talked about through the year. (laughs) So it might get you into trouble with your wife, but in the good books with your kids or other people you might buy some tech presents for. So I'll go through and do a bit more research and see what's out there. I'll make sure I pick things that are available now. They may not be readily available, but they're available now, not things that are coming at some time in the future. Or so no flying motorbikes at this stage? No, unfortunately. Okay, I'd love right. to put that on my yeah. tech guide just for my wife to buy me maybe. But no, things that are readily available that you can go into a local shop or online and be able to actually find somewhere and order. So I'll do that. And so next week we'll have that complete gift guide for, I don't know, we'll call it something like the gift guide for the nerd in your life maybe. Ah, fantastic. I can't wait for that one. Now, as I skim through the playlist for today, I see that it's party time at Microsoft as they celebrate 20 years of the Xbox. I see that brain-computer interface has just become a little bit more of a thing, and we're going to show how jumping on the coattails of the internet porn industry isn't as seedy as you think. Get your eyebrows raised in readiness for that one. But how's this for starters? Folks, are you tired of having a weak Wi-Fi signal in the sunroom at the back of your house? Sure, it's the nicest place to sit on Sunday morning, but... You just can't stream videos reliably. Or maybe the problem is for you, further out in the back shed. There's work to be done and it's a nice place to be able to stream music or podcast, but the the signal is just a bit finicky. Matt, surely we can leave those first world troubles behind as we head into 2022. Well, imagine if you're in your backyard and you couldn't listen to Tech Talk, James. That would be a major That'd problem. Be a problem. It would be. And we need a solution for it. And in fact, I think it happened a few years ago where my daughter lodged a major complaint with her father. She said, Dad, you're into your technology, you seem to know lots about technology, but do you know, in our house, I can't get good Wi-Fi in the toilet. <laughs> now, I didn't want to go into detail about maybe it's not the greatest thing for sanitation. Yeah, put, put down the phone and go to the toilet That's and then right. come back to your phone. Now, why do you take half an hour in the toilet? Yeah, I've got a question for you, though. Has this got anything to do with vaccinations? <laughs> no. Okay, no, all Should right. it have? <laughs> okay. No, no, no. All right, okay. We'll Vaccinate leave that for the co- conspiracy podcast. Vaccinate her against the toilet, maybe. I'm right, not sure. Okay. But that was a major complaint. So, of course, good old tech dad had to go and install a couple of extra wireless access points around the house. So we end up with four now around our house to cover the whole house and a bit of the backyard Mm. so I could take away those complaints. One. (laughs) That's right. You'd think that'd be good enough, wouldn't you? But no. So that finally, her first world problem was gone. She could now use Wi-Fi in the toilet. Phew, thank goodness for that. What a a good dad I am now. (laughs) The problem we have is at the moment, the two major bands that are typically used in Wi-Fi are the five gigahertz band, which... It's not to be confused with 5G. 5G. People yep. people have told me for years, I've already got 5G. Well, you haven't got it because no. it's not available yet. <laughs> no, no, I have got it, but it's just 5 gigahertz. They see the 5G and think that's what it is. So 5G is great for speed. You get speeds typically up around or theoretical speeds of 1,300 megabits per second. You don't normally get that in the real world, but that's a theoretical speed. The problem is that you typically might, in a normal house, get about 15 metres away from your router. It depends on the construction of your house and all the things that Mm -hmm. might be in the road. So that's great for speed, not so great for range. Drop down to the 2.4 gigahertz range or band, the range jumps up. I've found typically around 40 metres is a pretty good range with 2.4 gigahertz, but the speed drops back to maybe 600 megs per second. Mm. What the Wi-Fi Alliance has done is they've certified a new protocol. 
they've said that we need longer range because Matthew's daughter needs to be able to have Wi-Fi in the toilet. <laughs> I'm sure that was number one priority in and the plus mind. The people parked out the front of the house uh, trying to get your wife access your Wi-Fi. Absolutely, they've been complaining. And your neighbours too. Yeah, well, gotcha, can't yeah. I use your Wi-Fi? Why should I use mine? Why should I have to pay for that? So the new Wi-Fi is called Wi-Fi Halo, spelled capital H A capital L O W. So the idea with this is that you can get up to a kilometre range. Now, that sounds wow. incredible. That's the back paddock. <laughs> I'm just well, talking nearly. about some of those ranges there that you get of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Yeah, so wow. this sounds fantastic. Why haven't we had this already, James? Why have yeah. we waited this long? They've been holding out on us. The problem is that it's able to do that by virtue of the fact that it's got a lower frequency. And, of course, we've talked about it before. Mm-hmm. You drop those frequencies down, you get a longer uh, wavelength, wavelength, so you're yeah. able to get through things a bit easier and extend that range. But of course, the lower frequency, the longer wavelength means not as much data. So those speeds that I've talked about on 2.4 and 5 aren't going to be available. So given the fact that we all have this need for speed, why would the Wi-Fi Alliance bother with something so pathetic that it wasn't faster than the last one we had? And the real use for Wi-Fi Halo will not be for sitting on the toilet streaming a 4K movie or streaming some 4K series. It will be in connecting all these Internet of Things. So at the moment, we're talking about maybe 13.8 billion things are connected across the world. The estimation is by 2025, 30 billion things will be connected. And the first example I think of is I've got a few devices around our house. One of the ones is on a lock on one of the doors. It's connected to Wi-Fi. It's got batteries inside it. It locks via my phone. I can do all sorts of wonderful things with it, be notified, etc. But I find the four AA batteries in it get chewed up about every two months or so. Yeah, right. What needs to be transmitted? A minuscule amount of data needs to basically say either a signal from my phone to say, please open or close, or a signal from the lock to say, I've just been opened or closed. So the amount of data that needs to be transmitted is nothing. It doesn't need 1,300 megabits Mm. per second. What it does need is good range and also low power consumption. And they will be the two attributes, the two reasons you would use Wi-Fi Halo rather than one of the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz bands because you've got that great range and low power usage. So now when you talk about all the things around our house, all the smart home sensors, all the bits and pieces that we want to connect because we need them connected, obviously. They'll be using, in the future, not yet, but they'll be using Wi-Fi Halo. They'll get you better range, but they'll also have very low power consumption. So those four AA batteries might last me a year. Yeah, very, very cool. Mm. And, of course, vaccinations won't improve your Wi-Fi signal either. Oh, look, I'd like it if they could. If that would be so easy, yeah. just have a jab in your arm and now I've got wonderful Wi-Fi. Could we make it that way, please? <laughs> and, and with this new Halo system, um, there's no need for aluminium foil hats or anything like that? No, it's, it's lower frequency. People seem to get really concerned about the higher frequencies for mm. some reason, yeah. especially when you say things like millimetre wave. That gets people really stirred up. <laughs> they then start to think suddenly it's going to be microwaves coming out at us. Yeah. But again, it all comes down to the power that we're using for all these. Every frequency could be deadly if you put enough power into it because it mm. generates some heat. So we can heat up our body if we go zapping or zipping enough power into ourselves. But obviously these are low enough power. They're not doing that. But I can see this being used in a whole range of areas. Internet of Things we use to monitor things like bridges. You build a bridge, you want to know whether it's deforming slightly or when it needs maintenance or even equipment Mm. out in the field, a mining company, for example. All these little things I can see using Wi-Fi Halo. But even in a farm situation where I know farms that have got centres on various pumps around their paddocks or various irrigation units, all these things I want to be able to monitor remotely. You don't have to go out onto the farm and drive around and look at all these things. That's so yesterday. But again, this sort of Wi-Fi Halo... One Wi-Fi connection point could cover maybe 300 hectares. So again, you might have a farm bigger than 300 hectares, but a multiple of these points could cover those radius around each one of a 300 hectares. So that sounds pretty exciting and changing a whole landscape. A lot of those Internet of Things devices connected now are connected to the mobile phone network. But again, they use more power and it gets expensive yeah. when you're paying a subscription each month. Just having one Wi-Fi device like this, I think this is really opening up the world for all of these new exciting things. Yeah, really tidy things up there. Yeah, I think so. Any real estate agent that has been in the game longer than, say, a New York minute will be able to tell you that, about the changing trends that influence home buyers in their purchase. Well, what would you say to this big ticket item of the current era? While some are interested in the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, others need a decent garage or or maybe access to amenities, a big decider is to either close the deal or, or to break it in two is, wait for it, broadband quality. Matt, does fibre to the node bring a discount on a new home? 
It does, but before I talk about that, what's a New York minute? How long's that? <laughs> it's supposed to be uh, just a quick little moment. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask where that comes from? Turn a phrase. I've got no idea where it came from, but okay. um, New York minute, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no. All well, my part. apologies for my ignorance it's, on that topic. It's a flick of your fingers there. Right, okay. Well, it is interesting because I believe that fibre to the node would have a huge influence on someone like me not buying a house. Fibre to the premises would be the only sort of connection I would accept or knowing that I could buy a house that was my dream house with fibre to the node and then upgrade it. That would be the only way it would be acceptable. I, I would agree. Whether or not it would make or break the deal, though, for me, I, yeah, it would certainly be a consideration. If we were fibre to the node, it would be a case of, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and the difference is that you might go uh, to one house and go, yeah, to another house. They may be similar, but one's got five on the node, one's got five on the premises. Yeah. That might be the, the deal breaker. I've actually talked to estate agents around different spots in Australia about this particular problem because I was interested in some places I know that had some parts of the city fibre to the node and some parts fibre to the premises. And there are some streets, obviously there's always going to be a boundary, some streets that have got one side of the street FTTP and one side FTTN. And I just wondered whether there was a price differential there when agents were selling them or whether it was easy to sell. And when I talked to local agents, they told me that, yes, people ask about it, but a bit like you, it wasn't a deal breaker and they couldn't really put a price on it. But in the UK now, there's been a complete survey done of how important this sort of answer is when someone's talking about buying a home. Yeah, right. During the pandemic, they found that the inquiries for full fibre houses in the UK went up by 69%. So call it 70%. So 70% yeah, okay. of people came along and said, I'm interested in a house, but it's got to have fibre, is kind of the, the phrase, the question they would ask. When you then go to speeds of 300 megs or above, that was about 34% of people. 33% said that it would add, they would prepare, be prepared to pay £5,000 more for the house if it had fibre connectivity. Twenty-three <laughs> percent said they wanted gigabit speeds, and once it's got fibre, you probably know you're going to get gigabit speed at some point in time. So the five thousand pounds figure I find interesting, and there were some surveys done in the US with Google. They'd rolled out some gigabit connectivity around various communities, and they found there was a price differential for those same houses in another town that was nearby that were similar houses. But this is a really good contrast because this is saying in the same community in the UK. Where there are houses that are effectively the same, but that one just over there has got fibre, but that one doesn't. So everything else is equal, the transport links, the area, all those sort mm. of things are equal, but the fibre, there's £5,000 different. So it's quite significant. Yeah, I, I, well, I think, yeah, even though it's significant, I, I, I really think that, um, yeah, that's probably, I'd make the same decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if someone said you pay, convert £5,000 to Aussie, maybe $10,000, say, someone said that house is going to be $500,000, that one's 510000 for Fibre to the premises, yeah, I'd pay that ten grand without without even thinking yeah, about it. Yeah. But then when they said to people, "Tell us the most important factors for buying your home," oh, number one yeah. was the size of the property, mm -hmm. and that kind of makes sense because that's probably going to be pretty closely linked to the price of the property. Mm -hmm. I've got a budget of X; I can therefore afford a price or a house that's this particular size. Say that's pretty standard. Yeah. yeah. Number two was the type of broadband. Number two. No way. It was ahead of there you go. the number of bedrooms, ahead of the age of the property, and it was ahead of the transport links. So, all look, I can live with no transport links. I can live with having to ride a push bike <laughs> or walk to work and not worry about catching a bus or a train. As long as I've got good broadband at home, that's all okay. Even the size yeah. of the, the number of bedrooms, that was one that blew wow. me away. Look, I've got four kids. Oh, this has only got one bedroom, but it's got fibre to the premises. <laughs> I'll have that, thanks. <laughs> the kids can all sleep in the lounge room. Yeah. <laughs> but it is quite wow. fascinating, and it's probably pretty important for Aussie governments at the moment when they're talking about maybe doing some upgrades of fibre to the node, mm. whether that's the consumer themselves paying for them or whether they start to roll it out and backfill all the fibre to the node to be fibre to the premises, it makes a difference, obviously. If people are expecting it now, if you went to buy a house and didn't have electricity connected, you'd say, oh, what's it going to cost me to get electricity? I don't, don't really want that. Oh, that place up there's got electricity. I'll have that, thanks. Yeah. It's not quite at that level for fibre at the moment, but it's not getting far away that you expect that to be a basic service connected. Well, I remember being sold at, you know, from, by our government uh, at the time saying, oh, look, you know, you, you can have copper to the from, from the node to your premises and, you know, it's pretty good. Who needs and, more than 25 megs per second to watch a movie was, I think, the, <laughs> the, the quote or that was a paraphrased version of the quote. And, of course, they missed the point. The point is that 
we do a lot more with it than watch a movie. That's one of the things we can do with it, sure. But yeah. one of the things that's really important is the upload speed because so many people now, with all their Zoom meetings, they need good upload speeds, for example. But other things you do, you want that good upload speed as exactly. well. Exactly. But if it was okay at that time, that allows nothing for what might happen in the future. Absolutely spot on. The modern age of information has brought some major revolutionary changes in the way that we communicate, and it's enabled some extremely creative money earning for for some very enterprising individuals. This next story exemplifies that. Now, it's pretty common knowledge that the internet inflated the market for porn exponentially almost overnight. Being lewd and crude in the nude earns big dollars. Well, one clever maths teacher wanted in, and he's now making big dollars out of Pornhub. But not like you'd think. Matt, this is a pretty neat story right down to the square root of it. (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) I do love the creativity of people. <laughs> there are so many jokes that are going to come on here. I'm not quite sure that I'm going to be able to deliver all of them. No, that's right. So this guy thought there was a market out there for some form of online teaching. Of his mathematics. He's a maths teacher. Hmm. He wanted to be able to teach that online. So he invested a lot of money, about $49,000 Aussie, in getting an online tutorial service going. He thought it was fantastic. Hmm. What a great way to deliver maths to students, love maths, love teaching, and I can make some money along the way, and it didn't work. It failed dismally, and he's now 49 grand in the hole. What do I do about that? Yeah. Well, Pornhub sounds like a good thing to do if that's what you want to do. Yeah, right. But he took a different approach. He said, well, I couldn't get students to come over to my online tutoring site, so what about if I went where the students are? <laughs> I reckon they're on Pornhub. That that little rabbit hole there. (laughs) And he said, I'm going to go and deliver my math lessons on Pornhub. Now, of course, the first thing I thought was he's obviously delivering them in the nude or he's got some... Yeah, something's happening in the background there. (laughs) Keep keep them interested. Maybe using some calculations, using the human body as a measurement tool. (laughs) Who knows? There's all sorts of things that went through my head, but he didn't do any of that. He just stood there with a grey hoodie on, had a chalkboard, good old-fashioned chalkboard, not even a nice magic whiteboard. It was just a chalkboard with (laughs) Ah. some chalk and gave math lessons. Kept his clothes on, didn't do any lewd or crude jokes along the way, and believe it or not... And it's worked for him. It's worked for him. (laughs) So Ah. he's got 7,000... Mr. Chang, that's fantastic. (laughs) He's got 7,000 subscribers now. He's got over 2 million views over the last year on the course he's been delivering. And he's paid back his $49,000, and he's now making good money. Now, I'm not sure if you'd want to say this to your mum. Mum, I'm making good money now on Pornhub. I think I'd just say (laughs) on my math lessons that I'm giving online, mum, I'm making good money. But... What I love, the creativity. That's just absolutely fantastic. So yeah. I can see lots of other people now saying, I'm going to follow the lead of Mr. Chang and I'm going to go and put my, whatever it is, my lessons on how to put makeup on or my lessons on how to pull apart a V8 engine, whatever it might it's be. It's time for us to have a production meeting right now. Well, I think we should put Tech Talk on Pornhub, James. <laughs> <laughs> Fully clothed, well, of course. Like, yeah, yeah. No, just, just deliver it as we always have. That's right. And, um, oh, well, you mean... Go. We, People we just want to break from from their their viewing of the porn, and they just I think that's it. I, I actually read some exhausted. of the comments there. Wipe the sweat off the brow and. <laughs> And in you get for some maths. <laughs> That's right. I think people said, I wanted something a bit different. And this was definitely different to uh, everything else that's on Pornhub. I applaud him. That is fantastic. <laughs> well, how's this for a segue then, folks? How long can you last? Or rather, do you ever worry about how long you're going to last? Uh, have you ever worried about your battery size or maybe your fast charging? Is that what's preventing you from buying an EV? Perhaps the answer for lasting longer lies somewhere beyond size and speed, folks. It's time to talk frankly about range anxiety. And to be clear, we're talking about electric vehicles now. Matt, please clean up my messy introduction. <laughs> it was good. needing some cleaning up, wasn't it? <laughs> so everyone's had the experience, I'm sure, where they've run out of petrol at some stage mm-hmm. and they go and get a jerry can. Some or nervous the, moments for sure. That's right. The petrol can they've got at home for their lawnmower, whatever. Take it to the petrol station. Get a bit of petrol in there, take it back to their car, spill most of it on their hands on the side of the car. I remember actually making a funnel out of a newspaper one time because oh. I had no funnel there, so I got it on the newspaper and most of it went in and a bit went over my hands, whatever, but you got the car going again. And so one of the things that people think of with EVs is you get stuck on the side of the road and then they start to make the jokes about the, oh, I need a 10 kilometre extension meter to go and plug back into home or mm. how do I get someone to come along and give me some charge up or whatever. 
this is exactly what a company's decided to do. They've to come up with a little product that's like a jerry can. It's a zip charge. They make two models. One's a four kilowatt hour, one's an eight kilowatt hour battery. You put that battery in the boot of your car and you've got that extra bit of range if you need it. So you drive your EV, you keep an eye on the range. Everything goes along as normal. One time you get stuck or one time you just didn't quite get the calculation right or you took a wrong turn somewhere. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh. I've got my spare battery in the boot. Pull the spare battery out, plug it in, quick little zip charge, and away you go, the extra four or eight kilowatts. We all know that EVs have got a bigger boot space as well these days. They don't have petrol in there, so they don't have a petrol tank, so you've got that extra space to put a zip charge in there, presumably. You You might only do it, for example, if you're going on a longer trip. If you're just doing your run around town on a normal daily basis, you wouldn't worry about it too much. You might just use it for those things because it's got a bit of extra weight, so that's obviously going to use a little bit of extra battery power to actually carry that extra weight. But I think it is a good way to get people past their range anxiety. If this is what helps people get into the EV movement, then fantastic. I actually don't have a real problem with range anxiety because the cars are so accurate with how far you've got to go on the battery, how far you've got left on that battery, and it does vary a lot with the driving speed. So if you want to go a bit further, just drop the average speed down a little bit and you soon find that it extends it out. But for people that really don't feel comfortable with it, this is where this is great. And they actually have a model where you don't buy it, you just lease it on a monthly basis. So you might first get an EV and then you say, I'll get this zip charge just for the first few months until I feel comfortable that the range is okay Mm. and then I'll hand it back in and everything's okay. And considering most people are going to be driving around town anyway, so let's face it, it's only those long, big long trips that we're worried about here. Yeah, that's right. I did see one other good use for it, which I thought would work really well in a big city. I've had people tell me that there's no way they could buy an EV because they live in an apartment block and they're not going to drop an extension lead out from the fourth floor of the apartment (laughs) block and drop it down the side of the building and (laughs) run it over to where their car is and plug it in. So EV is no good for me. There's other ways to charge it. But this is not a bad way to do the same thing. You can actually charge it up in your house, in your unit, for example, and then you can just bring the unit down and plug it into your car and charge it up. Maybe they'll make a bigger unit than eight kilowatt hours because you might want to put more than eight kilowatt hours into your car. You don't want to have to keep bringing it down and taking it back up and bringing it back down to charge up your car. But again, it might be enough just to get you to a normal supercharging station or some of the faster charging station that might be out there. To get yourself out of trouble. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I just I make it makes sense, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, you know, people still talking about range anxiety, and and it's, it's all sounding a bit like an excuse. I still haven't heard a story yet from anyone saying oh, I ran out of charge and I was out the back of Burke. And yeah, um, anyway, I've yeah. actually got a friend of mine who wanted to see how far he could get once his EV got to zero, and so he basically had a where he lived. There was a small block around I'll his put house. It to the test, he right. did. So it, it got down to zero, and then he kept driving just slowly around where he was so that he wasn't ever very far from his home so he could push it back home if he needed to. Mm. And it went for a little while on zero, went for another three or four kilometres on zero, and then it went into super slow mode. So it would still keep going, but he just had to go very slow, went for a couple more kilometres until finally he got to the stage where it finally stopped. But it was well and truly past the zero mark. Not that I would say to people, just don't worry about it, keep driving at zero and it'll all be okay. But they've obviously got a little bit of a safety margin built in there. And I've gotten my car, a couple of my cars actually, I've gotten to zero very close when I've been getting back to home. And then I go, well, I'm sure there's a couple of kilometres there. And there, there is a couple of kilometres there. So mm. you can get those last couple of k's if you need to. Uh, again, don't push it too far. <laughs> don't say, well, Matthew said. <laughs> we're, not, <laughs> we're not sending out that risk message right there. Is there no honour among thieves? Crypto crime is a major burden of the modern world. And it would appear that for the predators of the cyber world, there is no low that is too low. The new threat, ladies and gents, is blackmailing Insta users into swindling their friends. Matt, of all the other cybersecurity threats we've discussed, why does this one feel the most ominous? It does seem like the lowest of lows, doesn't it? This one really feels oh. dirty. Yeah, I'm just worried about what you're going to come up with next week. <laughs> that's, that's right. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to. But this is one. Yeah. The, the only positive here is that it probably won't affect a lot of people because what they do is they go out and look for people that have got a lot of followers on Instagram. Right. And then they deliberately target their account to try and get access to the account. They try and get their password, a whole range of techniques I won't go into, but they try and get hold of that person's account. They take control of your account and they say, hi, James, I've taken control of your account. I'm not going to give you a password back. You've lost complete control of all those millions of followers you've got, except I just need you to do some little thing for me. Mm-hmm. Oh, whatever it is, whatever it is to get my Instagram account back. Surely it can't be too hard. What do you want me to do? Just make a video and recommend 
this investment scheme to your followers. Oh, and then once you do that, right. we'll give you back access to your account. And access to your account. And then, of course, that investment scheme that you're going to recommend to your followers is a complete scam. So there you are, trustworthy James, saying to people, here's investment scam ABC. Please go and invest in that. It's a really good scheme. I've got my money invested in that. Lots of your followers go and do it. They lose lots of their money. Mm. And then you may and or may not. And the good guys not. become the bad guy. That's right. But you may or may not even get access back to your Instagram account because the person doing all this probably isn't the most probably. honourable person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're working on an assumption here that they are going to do what they said they did. That's right. Or they might say, well, James, thank Trick you for you. that. 20 people invested in the scheme now, but I need 50. Can you go and do another video for me? Hold on. You said, well, that's right, but I've changed the rules now because I can change the rules. I don't know what you would do after this happened to you. Obviously, before it happens to you, make sure you have a secure mm. password. Make sure it's very difficult to break. Make sure you change on a regular basis. All those normal bits of advice I'd give. But after this, I mean, I just don't think I would want to lose my credibility on telling people to go and invest in something that I know is a scam, but at the same time, you'd hate to have built up this incredible yeah. account with all these followers to then lose it all to some scammer. It would just it would be devastating either way. It'd be a bit like me giving you a gun, James, saying, Can you just go into that supermarket, hold up the supermarket, hold them at gunpoint, mm. then once you've got the money, bring the gun and the money back to me and I'll take it off you and say thanks very much. Mm. I mean it's kind of like that. Which is yeah, it is very low. Yeah, and the good guys become the bad guys. I just yeah, as you said, It'll just be a case of sacrificing your account, I guess. Yeah. 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 yeah I don't think I could do it. I think I'd just have to say, whoops, that one's gone. Yeah. I have to go and start a new account and away I go. Start getting your millions of followers. Well, luckily I've got not enough friends for that, so um, <laughs> I'm like, You're an unlikely moment. target. <laughs> 20 years ago, I remember reading about brain-computer interface. It was being showcased at technology fairs around the world in the early 2000s as a modern marvel, but it was still quite clunky back then. Well, as processing power has become, well, more powerful and more accessible, it's now hitting the marketplace in a very meaningful way. We're talking, of course, about controlling a computer with your eye movements. And this has some big implications, particularly for creating access for the disabled. Matt, a really good news story here to pick things up for us. Yeah, it is. I often talk to, well, not often, sometimes talk to my wife when we're talking about life insurance and permanent disability insurance. Mm. I've often said, look, if I lost use of my legs and I was in hospital and all I had left was my brain and my voice and my hands, I'd be okay. I think I could get by. I could do lots of stuff that I do. Sure, I don't want to do that, but I could get by with it. But without my hands and just my mm. voice and my brain, I'd be pretty frustrated. I couldn't use a computer. And there are lots of people out there that have got disabilities, motor neuron diseases, for example, even people that have got that late onset of Parkinson's where they're losing fine motor control of their hands, mm. that that is the reality for them. Sure, they've got their hands, but they just haven't got good enough control of them to use things like a computer or like a tablet or an well, iPad. Stroke victims as well, yeah. Absolutely right. So there's, there are many people out there, and we probably forget about those people sometimes. We don't necessarily see them on a daily basis or we're not experiencing it ourselves, but luckily there are people out there trying to work out solutions for people that do have various disabilities, various accessibility options. And this latest one is absolutely fantastic. It's focused specifically on the iPad because Apple's been developing iPad OS 15 to have some extra features in it, including this ability. And then it relies on some third-party manufacturers. This particular one that's been made is the first one that's come out so far, where it basically clips over the camera on your iPad, the front-facing camera. So while you're using the iPad, you can move your eyes around, and that would be the same as you moving your finger around on the screen. Yeah, wow. Fairly incredible technology to track your eye movements to that level. Yeah. For example, if I've got all the icons on screen and I want to go and open up my mail icon and send off an email, I can move to that mail icon with my eyes. I can blink to actually trigger that to be actually opened, a very deliberate blink rather than a normal blink that I have when I'm just wetting my eyes. And then once I've got that open, I can use voice to talk to my iPad and then tell it that I want to send an email to someone and what the subject is and the body of the email, etc. Mm. Again, not perfect because it'd still be things that I could imagine that personally I'd be very frustrated with that I couldn't just do something with a bit finer control. But for someone that can't use an iPad at all because they don't have good enough control of their hands, this would be absolutely magical. Yeah, that opens uh, some opportunities up. And um, look, I'm just speaking from my own personal point of view here that I'm a little bit distractible. I can imagine that <laughs> yeah, that my eyes probably flitter a little bit over a screen uh, as they get distracted. So I, I can only assume that either you've got to develop some training for this 
um, or um, it, it's able to deal with that noise, that extra blinking and whatnot that is, uh, I guess you'd call it noise. Yeah, there is some training for it. So it's a fairly expensive solution. We're talking about thousands of dollars, but that's not too bad. If you had some of these issues where you just couldn't use an iPad, I think a few thousand dollars would be cheap. Well, but as opposed to millions of dollars is what it was. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So that's the first part. But yeah, you then have to do a fair bit of training. And they assess your condition as well to make sure that you're able to use this sort of technology. But then you do do a fair bit of training, as you say. And I don't know if that training tries to make you less distractible. <laughs> I don't know if that's the Squirrel. purpose. Ah, what? <laughs> but it's certainly <laughs> allowing you to get to the point where you can focus on where you move your eyes. And I've never really thought about where my eyes are on the screen when I'm using it, but I imagine a bit the same as you, that people do look away at different things from time to time, something else on the screen catches their attention. So you would really have to be focused on where you want your eyes at any point in time. Mm. That would make sense to me. But again, I think people would just go, wow, this is fantastic. I I can finally do something. Yeah. Uh, Give some vitality. Okay, folks, crack the party poppers, cue the streamers and the ticker tape and bring out the cake, the uh, the Microsoft Xbox has turned 20. You feeling old, folks? Uh, it's turned 20. So what does 20 years of difference look like, Matt? Well, there's a few things that look different, but I'll go back and talk a little bit about the Xbox because when it came out, it was different. It was revolutionary, and Microsoft was trying to do something that was different to the other gaming console manufacturers at the mm. time. At the time, it was really ruled by Sony, Nintendo, and even Sega were in there. Yeah, yeah. And the PlayStation 2 had been released the previous year. That was going fantastically. And then Microsoft came along, and they really tried to create one device that had a computer, a multimedia device, and a gaming console. And let's put all that in your lounge room rather than in the office where typically a computer that maybe could play some games was located. It had the ability to play DVD. It had the ability to be used as a computer, but also obviously play games. And so that was the yeah, idea for my I can remember when it came out, there was this uh, scepticism. You know, people were saying, oh, I was trying to do too much. Yeah, and I think that's right. It probably did try to be everything to everyone. I think that was Microsoft's solution. We'll make it better than the PlayStation because we can make it do everything. And people did question Microsoft getting into gaming consoles, and I was one of those people who questioned yeah. the logic of it, because at the time we were doing a lot with Microsoft with servers, and they were trying to get better with their servers and Exchange servers and SQL servers, doing a lot with desktops and networking. They were going, I thought, fantastically with mm. their software, and then suddenly made I, games. I remember even from the home entertainment you know perspective that I had a stereo, and its job was to play me the music. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't need that to come from another box. Yep. I didn't need it to come from something else. And, you know, I had a computer and, and its job was to do, uh, well, I was playing games on that, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I recognise you could have your games on your telly as well. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, I, it felt like it was invading on... <laughs> All sorts of spaces there. On some spaces. Turn yeah. on everyone's toes at the same time. Why not? I'm Microsoft. I'm big. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Anyway, they did come out with it and I'm almost a bit surprised that it's still going and still popular 20 years later. Probably the biggest issue for Microsoft is getting the games. With any console manufacturer, it's all about the games. The console needs to play the games, but obviously you need the games on your console. Mm. And there are some games that obviously are only on PlayStation or only on Xbox. So that's a bit of an issue. But that's been the issue from day one for Microsoft, making sure all those games are made for their console as well as PlayStation, or maybe exclusively for their game. But when you look back, as you do 20 years ago, the, the specs are quite laughable. It had 64 megs of RAM. We don't even measure RAM in megabytes now. It's all measured in gigabytes, obviously. 64 gigs of RAM. That's my current computer I've got. It's 64 gigs of RAM. So 64 megs is a bit of a joke. It had a huge 8 gigabyte hard drive. Now, again, we don't even really measure hard drives in gigabytes or terabytes now. But you would expect that to happen in that sort of time frame, that 20-year time frame. But even some of the, the ways you connected, the things that were there, you had to pay extra for the high-definition AV pack. It was 20 bucks extra for a high-definition AV pack, which gave you some extra cable connectors to be able to plug into your TV. And then it was really exciting because not only did it have the old 4.3 format, the 4.3 ratio, but it was this new HD 16.9 ratio. Wow, blew but it all open. what it's a like, waste of time because who had a 16.9 TV about 20 <laughs> years ago? What are you even wasting your time with that for, Microsoft? And obviously getting to the stage where you had high-definition at 720p or 1080. Yeah. So those things, they were certainly there and, and getting there in terms of that, but also having things like the ability to connect to a local area network, an Ethernet connection, 
or even connecting to, for example, a broadband connection. Why would you need that? Mm. And I think Microsoft were a bit ahead of it all at this time because you could actually pay $50 and get Microsoft's Xbox Live Starter Kit, which could play games online. Oh, why would you do that? It's too slow to play games online. What a, what a ridiculous concept. But obviously, Microsoft were really ahead of it in that scenario. Yeah. But it's still going, still going strong. Again, somewhat to my surprise. But well done to Microsoft. You've come up with a concept. You want to take on the competition. The competition's still there, but you're still plugging away. And competition is great for you and I as consumers. It absolutely is. Yeah. Now, what what a fantastic sort of thing, though, that they, they kind of have driven our entertainment uh, and, and how we access uh, entertainment. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. And so when you look at it now, you've really still got Nintendo. They've been ruling the roost for some time. Uh, they, they've basically been on top for about three years. PlayStation 5 just got past them recently. Uh, you're talking about volumes of around maybe 700,000 units a month in, in the US alone. So they're the sort of quantities that, say, Nintendo selling with their Switch. As I said, the PlayStation 5 is getting back just on top of that at the moment. So there's some pretty big numbers that people are, or these companies are selling out there still of these. And Microsoft's right up there in amongst the mix. As the rest of the world looks to new clean energy sources, I say the rest of the world because, well, Australia, a big deal is how we supply the aviation industry with clean energy. Electric planes at this stage are not a viable commercial option. There's a bit of hope in hydrogen fuel, however, but we're not there yet. Matt, where are we at this point in time for aviation? Well, we're not there yet with aviation with hydrogen, but I think we'll get there. And mm. hydrogen makes a lot of sense. Now, of course, when I say hydrogen and aircraft, everyone thinks of a great burning mass of Hindenburg, and they'll yeah. get a bit scared about that. Yeah. And there's some issues there. Again, obviously, that was used for flotation, the hydrogen there. And I think you've pointed out before that the actual paint was a big part of how that yeah, fire... Yeah, the material uh, of the fire. I mean, they got their initial spark and the, the, the initial explosion, but you know, that, the big fire, the, the, the photo is of the material burning. Yeah. yeah. So we don't want to have people necessarily going around in a blimp, but we think there's enough ability there for hydrogen to be used for engines on a plane, and there's a couple of different options which I'll get to in a moment around those engines. But just go back one step, I think there is some potential for electric planes to be used in short hops. Mm. When you've got those sort of one-hour flights that are being flown now by smaller aircraft, the ability to have enough battery to get it over those short hops and then charge up again and go again with electric motors are quieter, let's face it, and they'll be more reliable. So I think those short hops, we will get to the stage, let's say 15 years' time, James, I think we'll see small flights around most parts of the world when you've got those regional areas coming into a metro area or large metro to metro areas of those, say, one-hour flights, I think you'll do those in electric planes. And, and do you think excited. that will come with a, a cheaper cost as well? I, I think so because you'll have less maintenance on the, the engines. And that's mm. where electric vehicles, anything that's electric, those electric motors are so free of maintenance because there are so few moving parts. I mean, my car, my total car has got 43 moving parts in it. So mm. you've got these reduction in parts. And on aircraft, one of your major costs is maintenance going forward. Plus, obviously, the fuel is a major cost for that. So when you start to say we want to do those one-hour flights with electric, I think you'll get there. But when you start to say I want to fly Sydney to LA, when you want to do those 13,000 kilometre flights, to give you an idea what you'd need to do for an electric plane with that, something like a 787, maximum takeoff weight for that is about 227 tonnes. That's fully laden with fuel. Mm. If you had enough battery power to get you 13,000 kilometres, you'd need to add you know, maybe 3,000 tonnes of battery Whoa, okay. to your 227 tonne aircraft, which <laughs> sounds like it's that's not going to be that... Battery. <laughs> that's right. It's not going to be that viable to do that. But hydrogen, on the other hand, hydrogen is a great fuel, an energy-dense fuel, like aviation fuel is. So that sounds like a great solution there. Part of the issue in terms of the way they use the fuel is really interesting. One idea is you've got engines that burn aviation fuel. So why don't they just burn hydrogen? So there's certainly an option there to build or convert those engines over from aviation fuel to hydrogen and away you go. You've mm. just got the normal concept you've got now, but you're burning hydrogen. And you're they? making water that can be recycled. Absolutely right. So you haven't got the production of greenhouse gases that you've got with burning aviation fuel as you have, have now. But the other way you could do it, of course, is you could have hydrogen used in an aircraft to create electricity 
to then run electric motors. And again, you get that same advantage, electric motors, low maintenance, and, hydrogen and fuel quieter. Cell. Yeah, yeah. And using hydrogen fuel cell, absolutely perfect. So they're two options, and they're the ones that they're looking at, whether it be some form of even both of those, maybe some sort of hybrid model. Now, the issue, of course, or well, there's lots of issues. One of the issues is that people say, oh, no, hydrogen, we burn lots of coal or use lots of gas to create the energy to create hydrogen in the first place. Now, you do need energy to create hydrogen. That's right. But it's not a rule that you have to burn fossil fuels to get your energy, is it? Only if you're reading some certain sites that are against going forward with our whole world and saving the (laughs) the planet. But no, there isn't a rule that says you have to use fossil fuels to create hydrogen. In fact, there are some plans going ahead right now at certain spots around the world where they're building entire renewable energy farms, wind farms mainly, to create hydrogen, that is, clean hydrogen, if Mm. you can call it that. At the moment, we've got a a minuscule percentage of hydrogen created around the world that's clean hydrogen. But saying that, we don't create a lot of hydrogen. We don't need a lot of hydrogen around the world. Going forward, we might need a lot more. We're at the start. Yeah. Absolutely correct. So I think that's where we'll head in terms of getting to that point where we'll move forward with this. We'll have clean hydrogen. Aircraft will have it. So you can fill up your aircraft the same way you would have filled it up with aviation fuel, jump in the plane, go to Sydney to L.A., and everything will be fine, and the aircraft will be basically the same size. Now, some people, again, have that fear of the Hindenburg, but again, you haven't got that huge volume of hydrogen. Mm. And let's face it, in a normal aircraft now, you've got aviation fuel, which is flammable. You have a crash, you're going to have a fire. It's pretty certain of that. And the same with hydrogen. You have a crash, you're going to have possibly some damage and fire is going to be created from all of that. Obviously, so much is done in aircrafts to keep them safer. And whether it be with fuel, with aviation fuel, or with hydrogen, I'm sure there'll be a huge focus for manufacturers to keep it as safe as possible. But it's not going to go like the Hindenburg. It's not going to have mm. an issue like that where it's just coming down to land one day nice and quietly and then that's it. It's all gone in flames. So, again, a crash might be a different scenario. But I think this is the, the real future for that clean aviation. And let's face it, we're going really well in lots of other areas around the world where we can see the future where we're headed to create that basically climate-friendly environment, but this is one of the ones where we've real, really got a battle on our hands, but I think there'll be a solution there. Yeah, looking forward to that. And, and as we said before, we're, we're just when you burn the hydrogen, um, that you're just creating water. That water can be recycled. You can reuse it again, um, again and again and again. Oh, it just makes sense to me. I'm looking forward to the future. Do we call it burning hydrogen? Is it, is it called burning? Well, uh, you're reacting with oxygen, so I guess... I want to call it combustion. Combustion, okay. I'm I'm happy with combustion. (laughs) In the age of technological revolution, where advances in robotics threaten to replace humans across the workforce, you'd think at least there'll always be a place for the humble bartender, a friendly, forgiving face, a public access philosopher, an ear to chew, someone to pour your heart out to as they pour you some more muscle and brain relaxant. Surely you couldn't replace that with a robot. Surely not. Surely not. (laughs) But? In the movies, people always go to the bartender and unload their problems. I think a bartender's a bit like a hairdresser. They know everyone's problems, and if they keep it secret, they do a really good job. I was a big fan of Cheers, the old (laughs) sitcom from the 80s and 90s. Yeah, yeah, a big fan of that show. Yeah, so when's the last time you poured your heart out to a bartender? No, I have never done that. No, no. No, there was a lot of poetic license in that one there, yeah. Absolutely. So, again, I think we're discovering through these series of podcasts, James, that movies and sitcoms aren't always real. Mm. So, mm. cheers. Yeah, I, I love the idea of, of Norm there unloading about his wife every particular episode. And yeah, I'm, I'm still having trouble, though. If we go back to what we we're thinking about here with, with robots and, and pouring beers and whatnot, I just can't imagine getting my beer from a vending machine. Yeah, well, and this is the issue, I suppose, that people are getting to the point where it is harder to get staff. So you own a pub or anywhere that you Mm. might need to be dispensing alcohol and you just can't get enough staff. Or you can't get enough staff at the time you need it. So one of the areas that these robot bartenders are being used already is in sporting stadiums in the U.S., here you are watching the game, whether it be baseball oh. or grid on, whatever it might be, and no one's at the bar because everyone's watching the game. Yeah. Half time comes along or Bang. you, you go we've, and have a break in the innings. And, we've been there. That's right. And your lineup is enormous. That's right. Let me get back to the game. I'm watching a little tiny TV and I want to be out there and watching it in the real game. Yeah. So the bartenders then just can't serve enough beers in a short enough period of time to get people back out to the game. And then... The stadium doesn't want to employ the number of bartenders they would need because they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs for most of the time Mm. while the game's being played. So a robot bartender can serve beers much quicker, 
There's an outlay, obviously, a cost, but the cost is not quite a one-off because there might be some maintenance required, but typically a one-off cost for the bartender. They don't have sick days as such. They don't say, oh, I don't feel like working today, or that guy was rude to me. They just keep serving the beers, <laughs> dispensing the drinks, and you don't have the problem with, can you hear me as well? In a nightclub, you know, <laughs> can I order a, what was that again? And so it's always frustrating to order drinks at a loud nightclub. You don't have those problems because often you'll just order on your phone and then you'll walk over to the bar and pick up your, your drink. So you order on the phone, pay for it on the phone, and then away you go. Even vending machines, they do cocktail vending machines. There's one, her name, Cecilia. You walk up to Cecilia and you'll either talk your cocktail, you'll say, I'd like a vodka sunrise, please. And next thing you know, you'll pay for it with your credit card. And then there's a vodka sunrise sitting there that's been dispensed. <laughs> and all the owner of the pub or the establishment has to do is keep refilling the various components of all the cocktails that are required. Mm. They're in the... Vending machine? Makes sense, I guess. Yeah. But it's just not going to look as good as Tom Cruise uh, doing his fancy stuff back there in the 80s, is it? Not at all. They're not going to They're not going <laughs> to spin drinks in the air. Yeah. And they, they can't twirl bottles. They can't do any of those fancy things. Maybe they could. Maybe. Well, they could probably do it very accurately if it was programmed to do that, but their idea is to dispense drinks quickly rather than make them yeah, look fantastic. Right, okay. This is all about function over form, so I apologise for that. <laughs> but it does make sense. Whether it's going to come to a pub near you – probably would depend on how busy the pub is and how much trouble they're having getting bar stuff. I mean, if I owned a pub, I'd probably get one in for the novelty factor. Go down to Matt Hiddickerson's pub because he's got that cool robot bartender down there. Mm. I just think that would be a novelty, but still have the rest of your bartenders there doing their normal work. I don't think bartenders around the world should worry about going and lining up in unemployment queues because I think it's really only going to be used in specialist areas or as an add-on. Mm. But there just aren't enough bartenders either. So that's mm. a bit of an issue. But robotics are going to be introduced in so many different areas, so many different things. That natural language that we do when we talk to our phone or our devices in our home, that's being used in so many of these things. So you can use natural language when you talk to these robot bartenders as well. It's a different world out there. And do the robot bouncers uh, have reasoning as well? Do you know any? Do you know any bouncer that has any reasoning? They know their job, and they've got the badge on, so they will do whatever they they want to do. <laughs> and with that, folks, the call for last drinks has come and gone, and they're flicking the lights on and off for us. Time to take the hint and make ourselves scarce. Nice work on another top jo job uh, with the Tech Talk, Matt. Yeah, thank you. I'll go and sit a couple of kilometres from home now, use my Wi-Fi halo and do the research for next week's one where we'll look at all those latest gadgets we can get people out there and get them excited around Christmas. And in the meantime, I'll, I'm off to drag out the old Xbox out of the garage and <laughs> uh, get all nostalgic again for an afternoon. Thanks again for tuning in again, folks. Um, I'm your host, James Eddy. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You won't regret it. Sure.